This evening, our speaker is Stephen L. Spiegel. He is professor of political science at UCLA and the author of The Other Arab-Israeli Conflict, Making America's Middle East Policy from Truman to Reagan. This is a book which has received superb reviews from many quarters, including the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Commentary, and the New Republic. In 1986, it won the National Jewish Book Award. Professor Spiegel has written a number of other books and articles as well, many of them dealing with the topic of the Middle East. Even more impressively, considering the critical nature of students in general, those at UCLA have twice named him one of the four most recommended teachers in UCLA's upper division. Professor Spiegel brings impeccable academic credentials, a serious and deeply grounded interest in public affairs, and great verve to this forum. And therefore, it is a, a great pleasure for me, and I ask you to join me in welcoming him to the Baltimore Council this evening, Professor Stephen Spiegel. Thank you very much, Mrs. Riggs. And let me say thank all of you. As someone who teaches international relations at a university, I know how important it is for concerned citizens in this country to be interested and involved in foreign affairs. If we are to have an effective foreign policy, we need people like you. And of course, at this critical moment in world history, and I say that advisedly, it is important to discuss the affairs of the day. If any one of us had fallen asleep two years ago and suddenly awakened, I would suggest that we would have difficulty recognizing the world in which we live. Think about it. The Berlin Wall is gone. Germany is united. The Soviet Union has lost the Cold War is changing its political system, and is on the verge of economic and political collapse. Communism is disappearing. The Sandinistas are ancient history. So many dictatorial governments overthrown by democratic elections in Central America, in Latin America, in East Europe, and yet, even though Saddam Hussein was a friend then and an enemy now, even though no one could have imagined the occupation by Iraq of Kuwait two years ago, even though the Middle East is familiar, it is a region of the world which continues to be a cauldron of volatility, instability, uncertainty, and chaos. As a kind of indication of the way in which the world has changed in the Middle East but yet remains the same, I'm reminded of uh, a story told to me by a Russian friend in Moscow a couple years back. As we sat at a banquet, Russian style, ending an international conference of American and Soviet specialists on the Middle East. He told the story of Ayatollah Khomeini's problems in his late years, in which he was trying to solve the, the puzzle, why so many people were trying to leave Iran. And he sent one aide out after another to try to determine why it was that these people wanted to leave the great country, Iran. No one could give him an answer. No one could stem the tide. Finally, he said to his most close and trusted aide, come, we will get into the limousine, we will go, we will see what the story is. So they went to Tehran airport, and there were lines of people. And Khomeini said, now you go and find out what the problem is. 10, 15 minutes passed, and suddenly the people are leaving their places in line, they are leaving the airport. The aide comes back to the limousine, and the Ayatollah says, how can you explain? I have been working on this for weeks, and you, in 10 minutes, are able to solve the problem. What was your secret? The aide says, well, I will tell you, Your Excellency. 
I went over, and when they saw the limousine, they asked who was in it. When I told them it was the Ayatollah, and people started to say, well, if the Ayatollah is leaving, we're staying. <laughs> Now, I have been asked an almost impossible question this evening. Is peace possible in the Middle East? I would perhaps sooner answer a question like, can Michael Dukakis stage a comeback? Can Yitzhak Shamir smile? Can it snow in Southern California? In all of these, one is tempted to answer no. And one is tempted to answer no to the question, is peace possible in the Middle East? In the Middle East, peace means something else than it does in North America or in Western Europe. We cannot anticipate that any time soon, any decade soon, there will be the kind of tranquility that exists in our own region of the world or the European area. We have to look at a situation which is likely to be more subtle, more complex, more Middle Eastern, as they say, in the area. I want tonight to deal with two parts of the question, is peace possible in the Middle East? First, the more immediate issue of the Gulf crisis, and then the more complex problem of uh, the Arab-Israeli question. There has been much discussion in recent weeks about the linking of these two issues. They cannot be linked diplomatically. They must be linked analytically. First, let me offer eight possibilities for what will happen as a consequence of the Gulf crisis. I, uh, I will venture a prediction as to which is most likely when I conclude. I uh, can tell you that one of these eight scenarios will come true, in my opinion. They will not all come true, as you will see. In scenario one, the coalition which the United States has assembled so masterfully decides at some point to attack, not at midnight January 15th, but sometime after January 15th. The consequence is a major victory. Kuwait is restored. Saddam Hussein, if not overthrown, loses his massive weapons capability. He is in disarray. The United States is, in, is victorious. In scenario two, the same events occur. The United States decides to attack. But the results are not so positive from our perspective. In this scenario, it turns out that the analysts of military possibilities who were pessimistic, the analysts who argued that Saddam Hussein should not be underestimated were correct. And we bogged down. We are unable to dislodge him from Kuwait. The war goes on for several weeks, perhaps unfortunately months in the end, as in Vietnam, we retreat, and therefore, we lose. In scenario three, even after January 15th, there is no major development. But yet, the United States decides to stay the course. Those voices, the American political, diplomatic, and military elite, who argue that sanctions can work that after all, Iraq is weak in spare parts, that its industry, its military structure, will come eventually to grind to a near halt. Those voices are heard, the months go by. And as a result, people become impatient in America. The Arab coalition begins to crumble, that backs us. And in the end, the president is forced to retreat without a shot but without a victory. Scenario four is everyone's dream for this crisis. We wait it out, the weeks go by, and it is not we who crumble, but Saddam Hussein. He passes from the scene, he is overthrown. Uh, the people who say that in Iraq, 
if you oppose Saddam Hussein, you are either underground or you are underground. Those people are proved wrong. And in the end, uh, either because he changes his mind or his mind is changed for him by his own people, he withdraws and we win without a shot. Who would not welcome this development? It would be a new Iraq. It would have a potential for a new peace in the Middle East. It is, unfortunately, highly unlikely. The fifth scenario is a compromise. It is a kind of deal in which Saddam Hussein withdraws from all of Iraq or part of Iraq. We declare it a victory. There is some sort of secret maneuvering either between the Arab members of the co coalition and Saddam Hussein or between ourselves and the Iraqis. But in the end, we declare a diplomatic victory without firing a shot. Now, those who predict this outcome predict it on the basis that the two sides are really cornered. Saddam Hussein is cornered because if there is a war, most analysts believe, however bloody it may be, we will win. If he did not expect this, why would he be maneuvering? It's good Saddam on Monday and it's bad Saddam on Tuesday. And he plays the game with hostages, with people's lives, with statements. We haven't seen terrorist developments, thank God. And I believe that this is because he does not want a war. But George Bush is also cornered. He's cornered by the complexity of the Middle East, the complexity of the oil problem. He's cornered by our own domestic politics. There are those who believe that the Middle East will be worse off after this crisis, no matter what the results. After all, the oil problem has been solved. We have more oil online today than we had before the crisis began, even without Kuwaiti and Iraqi oil. Oil would be endangered more with a war than with a pro prolonged crisis or some kind of compromise. So both sides are cornered, and that is the incentive for a deal. Scenario five. So in scenario one, there's an attack with success. Scenario two, there's an attack with defeat. Scenario three, we wait it out and lose. Scenario four, we wait it out and win. Scenario five, there's a compromise. In scenario six, we call it the United Nations approach. There have been elements of a new emphasis on the United Nations, but scenario six is Franklin Delano Roosevelt's dream of a collective security arrangement worldwide. It didn't happen after World War II because of the Cold War. It's beginning to happen now. And certainly in this Gulf crisis of 1990, we have come closer to a genuine collective security arrangement than ever in world history. Well, it is conceivable, though not likely, that this crisis will ultimately be resolved by some kind of UN centrality, even more than we've seen so far. A kind of deputizing with blue helmets, the UN color, of those forces that are there. The UN takes over and arranges some kind uh, of arrangement. I don't think this is very likely, but it is certainly conceivable. In scenario seven, there's a great uh, change in emphasis from all of the other approaches. President Bush has an objective problem. He's a master tact tactician, but he has difficulty in framing the nature uh, of his vision of the future of world politics, of the future of American society, and of the reasons why we're in the Gulf. He has made the Kuwaiti issue, the resurrection of Kuwait, as a central feature of his policy. There are those, and the public opinions tell us the majority of the American people, who believe that a greater issue is the question of the arms that Saddam Hussein possesses. You can knock out the arms, the military tells us, while seeing a situation in which Iraq, at least in the short term, continues to occupy Kuwait. And that means a different military tactical 
use. It means that instead of a reliance on ground forces, which American strategy currently pursues, there would be a, a reliance on air power. General Dugan, was, uh, the former Air Force Chief of Staff, was sacked for talking too much to the press, but that's what he was arguing. And many pundits and analysts and strategists outside the government in Washington had been maintaining that what we, what we really ought to do is have a massive airstrike against the Iraqis, take out the potential nuclear facilities, the long-range missiles, the chemical facilities, and then rely on the embargo to see that Saddam uh, uh, Hussein ultimately decides to get out of Kuwait. So that's the uh, seventh scenario, the reliance on air power. It's a change of primary objective. It perhaps was easier when there was a greater international domestic consensus in August and September. It would be more difficult now, but it is still possible, depending on what happens after January 15th. Finally, scenario eight is a grab bag. Scenario eight is a kind of series of steps or alternatives which have one thing in common. You take a dramatic step, and then you say to Saddam Hussein, this is a taste of what we can do. Now, negotiate. Get out of Kuwait. Well, some of the suggestions that have been made have a, a kind of dogfight or, or show of air power over Kuwait and then retreat. Uh, and then you show Saddam Hussein what could be done, you know, sort of a sort of prediction of things to come, a taste of things to come. Second possibility, uh, if we had a map here, uh, I could show you that if you look at the, at the map of Kuwait, at, at, of Iraq, it's very complex. Um, it, it is not at, uh, it's very jagged, it's not at all smooth, but there, there is an area in western Iraq, a piece of territory between Syria uh, and Jordan, which could be, uh, it would be difficult because of the terrain, but could be taken. And there are those who argue, although it has not excited the administration, that in this kind of scenario, you take a bit of Western Iraq, and then you say to Saddam, okay, we've got Western Iraq, you've got Kuwait, let's trade. <laughs> and the final possibility involves Turkey. The Turks are not too excited about this, but there have been improved dams at the headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates, and um, as a consequence, what you do uh, is you get the Turks to cut off the water and you try to bring Saddam Hussein to his knees. All of these involve a dramatic step and then an attempt to force Saddam Hussein uh, uh, to uh, uh, give in. So we have eight scenarios here. In my opinion, the most likely, and I've said this for many, many weeks since the beginning of the crisis, it doesn't sound quite uh, uh, as um, courageous today as it did a few weeks ago. I believe a compromise. Scenario five is the most likely. Now, a compromise means that Saddam Hussein retreats from most of Kuwait, though he still may control it. He has, uh, after all, uh, decimated the country. It's a small city-state. Uh, uh, for those of you who have been there, it is like a, a kind of uh, palace in the sand. It is resurrectable, but it isn't the same. And politically, under this scenario, Saddam Hussein would have enormous influence over uh, developments and politics in that country and throughout the Gulf. He would also maintain his armaments, which would mean that we would have to pursue a very uh, active policy of arms control in the area. We would have to continue some kind of embargo. We would have to make sure that German companies and Swiss companies and French companies are not able to help Saddam Hussein develop these weapons. Whether, that, whether or not that would be satisfying to the people of the, peoples of the area who might be threatened by Saddam Hussein is problematic. Certainly the Israelis would have very serious questions with this kind of scenario. Nevertheless, in the end, I believe that it is the most likely and that it is the kind of Middle East we are likely to be looking at the second half of 1991. Of course, I could be wrong, and there might be war. As I say to my students, every week I predict there will be no war next week. So far, I've been right every week. <laughs> that may change, uh, and that will make for a very different kind of area. If there is a war, and Arabs die at the hands of Americans and other Westerners, 
there will be massive political dislocations. There will be tensions and terrorism. And as far as other areas of the Middle East are concerned, the Palestinians will feel a sense of depression having to some extent bet on Saddam Hussein. If there is no war and Saddam Hussein emerges intact, the Palestinians may feel a greater sense of confidence while it is the Israelis who will be particularly nervous. After the Persian Gulf crisis, the international community will undoubtedly turn to the Arab-Israeli question. It will be a different set of problems, whether Iraq remains in Kuwait, whether Iraq continues to have its massive weapons capability or not, whether Saddam Hussein is still in power or not. Keeping in mind that it is very difficult to think about the kind of peace which emerges in the Arab-Israeli arena, even several years hence, without knowing what the Persian Gulf crisis result is, in keeping in mind our scenarios, let me say some initial conclusions about the Palestinian question, and then during the questions and answers, we can certainly discuss this further. <coughs> Now, there are two ideas which will undoubtedly be in the headlines in the press to a greater degree uh, over the next several days, weeks, and even months. Already this week, we hear a good deal about them. The first is the idea of an international peace con conference for the Arab-Israeli theater. This idea has been around a long time. And we know that never has an Arab-Israeli peace or the possibility of a peace emerged out of multilateral negotiations of more than an Arab party, the Israelis, and American mediators. No other formula has worked. And I do not believe that an international conference will work. Indeed, you can only convene an international conference when you don't need it. If you need an international conference, it won't do you any good. But it is a very, very appealing idea. Bring everybody together. Make the UN work once and for all. Get the international community to solve this most unresolvable of international issues. It's a kind of reliance on a panacea. Not only will Israel, both Israelis of the left and the right, look askance at this kind of situation in which they are isolated. But it is also true that the Arab parties will be thrust into a situation in which because of Arab politics, they would have to toughen their own stand so that e each Arab participant can show uh, that it is not selling out its Arab neighbors friends, and even enemies. An international conference, even with the improved diplomatic position and posture of the Soviet Union, is a bad idea. And in the end, it will be very difficult, I think, for the American government to support it. The other idea is also a panacea that is initially appealing. And that is for a kind of uh, free zone for massive destructive weapons chemicals, nuclears, long-range ballistic missiles. Would that we could have such a free zone in the area. But we see in the much easier arena of Soviet American arms negotiations how difficult it has been over the years. And now, only now, after 30 years of struggling with these issues in a balance of terror, only now are we able to make dramatic progress because the issues of verification, inspection, and most important, basic mutual trust have been resolved. None of these conditions exist in the Middle East. It's not going to be easy 
to achieve some kind of breakthrough in the Arab-Israeli arena. The problem is that we Americans must not and should not succumb to the easy way out. You know, in baseball, if you go for a home run, you may strike out. In football, if you go for the bomb, you may have to punt. And in the Middle East, if you go for the easy way out, you may find things becoming far more difficult. The situation, in my opinion, is not hopeless. In Israel, out of the disillusionment and horror of Palestinian support for Saddam Hussein has come talk of a separation of the two communities. That has great dangers, but also great possibilities. In the Arab community, in the Arab world, in the history of the Arab world, we know that there is a way that can dazzle the Israelis into surprising concessions, and that was pioneered by Anwar Sadat. You know, I could design a strategy for Yasser Arafat that would bring him, I believe, a Palestinian state within a year. It would be a Sadat-like strategy in which he offered the hand of friendship to the Israelis. Arafat has not pursued it, in part, because while he may lack courage, political courage, he is not suicidal. Every other Arab leader who has pursued that, King Abdullah in the early 50s, Bashir Jamal in the early 80s, and of course Anwar Sadat in the late uh, 70s, each of these people, each of these leaders has been assassinated. But we have to work on Arab states. And if we emerge in a strengthened position out of the Gulf crisis, we will have more leverage over Arab leaders. We will emerge with more influence in the area. And then we have to work, it seems to me, at moving towards progress on the Arab-Israeli front, not only by moving on the Palestinian question, but by moving with Arab states to begin first secret and later public dialogues, the likes of which we see as a model in the Egyptian-Israeli relationship. What we have to avoid is the kind of situation we got into in early 1990, when Arabs, Israelis, and Americans each made critical errors. The United States, for its part, began to talk about Jerusalem, the most difficult of all questions, and put it forward. And while President Bush had had a very good 1989 in the Middle East and was very close to the beginnings of a peace process, he dropped the ball, in my opinion, when he began to emphasize Jerusalem. Henry Kissinger had a genius for making whoever he was talking to, Arab or Israeli or whoever, believe that he was on their side. Where George Bush and Jim Baker have gone wrong is to make Arabs and Israelis both believe he was, they, they are on the other side. And that's what they have to learn. On the Arab side, Arab politics have always been the great curse of the Arab negotiating strategy. And going back to the 1940s, history is littered with horror stories of American presidents who were close to some kind of progress and found themselves broken in their approaches by the problems of internal Arab politics. And we saw that in 1990, when finally President Bush was forced to cut off the incipient dialogue with the PLO. The PLO lost another opportunity. Abba Iban, the former Israeli foreign minister, often says, the Palestinians never lose an opportunity to lose an opportunity. <laughs> and 1990 was, was such an opportunity lost. But the Arabs are not the only ones with politics. The Israelis have their own politics, a vibrant democracy. Uh, the Israelis, unlike the United States, are still in a cold war and sometimes in a hot war. Their survival is at stake. And as a vibrant democracy, 
They have two parties, uh, among others, but two major parties, that are bitterly oppose each other's approaches. The Israelis have to depend and vote for a leader who will have the strength to overcome those politics. Make no mistake about it, and very few analysts have pointed this out. Israel is in the course of changing. It is estimated that within the next two years, one million Soviet Jews will come to Israel. That is an increase of 25% in the population. It's as if 60 million Americans uh, were suddenly to arrive. Now, this represents gargantuan economic and social problems. But from a political scientist's point of view, let me tell you, it's fascinating. Uh, because the entire political system will change. The entire balance of power in the Israeli Knesset, the Israeli par parliament, will change. And we don't know whether Soviet Jews will vote left in the elections of 1992, or right, or for a Russian party, or they'll split the same way. And American diplomacy has to pay more attention to these changing foci within Israel. And if we want to move the Israeli electorate in a particular way, we have to gain that confidence. Gain the confidence of Soviet Jews. Help with Soviet Jewish immigration. And guide our relationship with Israel so that we can make a difference. So there is opportunity. There's plenty of opportunity for diplomacy after the Gulf crisis in relations with Arabs, in relations with Israel, and developing our own posture. We're not going to have peace soon in the Middle East, certainly not now. But somehow, somewhere, some way, it may take decades, I believe, a more tranquil Middle East will emerge. Thank you very much. The, uh, the question is, when, you, when one speaks of a modus vivendi between, uh, the Arab, between the Arabs and Jews, why isn't the question of a peace treaty uh, between Israel and several of the Arab states, which are still in a state of war with Israel, uh, created? In early 1989, when President Bush took office, he pursued a highly innovative and intriguing posture. He asked the Israelis to come up with a peace plan of their own, and they did uh, with what became known as the Shamir plan, and then he adopted it as our own. But nobody paid much attention to the whole plan. The whole plan envisioned a Palestinian peace process, but also an Arab state-Israeli peace process, as well as some, some initiatives towards Palestinian refugees. We chose to focus on the Palestinian question. We did so as uh, our, our administration for two main reasons. One, because of the Palestinian Intifada, the Palestinian uprising, this was the major issue of the day. And secondly, we did so because the administration specialists concluded that if you address the Palestinian question first, then the Arab-Israeli issue could come into focus after the Palestinian question had been settled. I think that was a mistake because it put too much pressure on the two communities, Palestinian and Israeli, that were so close uh, to each other in terms of their working relationship, in terms of uh, the way they live. And I, as we begin to start up the peace process again, after the Gulf crisis, I think we've got to pay more attention to a breakthrough between Arab states and uh, Israel. The administration took a course which was reasonable, but I think that history now shows us it was incorrect. Mr. Shapiro. Uh, you didn't uh, touch on uh, religious fundamentalism as a factor. Do the leaders of these Arab countries, and I know the leaders of Israel can't deal with their fundamentalism, but the, can the leaders of the Arab countries deal with the, with the radical fundamentalist uh, religious uh, parties in their countries? Well, you're quite right. I didn't deal with fundamentalism. Uh, and it is a question that is likely to become more serious in the next several years because the Middle East is going to grow. It's going to grow as the Soviet Union collapses. Uh, if you look from Yugoslavia to India, 
We're going to have several new states with several arenas of instability over the next decade or two. Israel stands in the middle of all this. Islamic fundamentalism, therefore and thereby, will be potentially strengthened as the 50 mil million Muslims of the Soviet Union become, some of them, if not all of them, independent from Moscow. It will be strengthened uh, as the religious cauldron of this area uh, is heated up. And there will be challenges to power, as we see recently in Egypt, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. But I am uh, cautiously optimistic that these regimes can handle the issue of fundamentalism. Uh, take Hosni Mubarak of Egypt. What he is really concerned about is not the Arab-Israeli question. It's not ultimately even Saddam Hussein. It is his own fundamentalists. Uh, we even see this in Syria to some extent. Uh, we see this certainly in Saudi Arabia. But each of these regimes, while it is threatened, is attuned to these dangers. And I think we have to help them in this regard. I think we don't help them by shipping massive numbers of arms, as we're proposing to do vis-a-vis -vis Saudi Arabia. That's a good way uh, to destabilize this regime, as we saw in the case of Iran in the 1970s. You know, uh, people forget that the Congress of the United States in 1977 and 78 had decided to sell AWACS jets, those sophisticated jets, to Iran. If the Ayatollah had come to power 18 months later, he would have had AWACS jets. So we have to be very cautious. We have to be cognizant of this danger. But I think that if we work closely with, this, with the governments, and now with the Soviet Union, uh, we can handle it. Yes, sir. Would not your scenario five result in a strengthened Iraq, a victorious Iraq, so that you have a country capable of terrorizing? And how do you distinguish that from the situation that existed when Hitler was appeased? Well, first of all, let me say that I don't agree with the comparison between Saddam Hussein and Hitler. I believe that it trivializes the crimes that Hitler committed. I, don't, I believe that Saddam Hussein is a criminal. He's not a lunatic. He has handled himself throughout this crisis um, with great skill. Uh, we may not like what he has done, but he has proven himself to be a more cagey diplomat uh, than Americans or Europeans. And we are reeling uh, from that cleverness. I don't advocate uh, necessarily this scenario, but I do believe it will occur. Would this be a victory for Saddam Hussein? In part, yes. Uh, it would be a victory because he would still be in power. He would still have his weapons, even if he were out of Kuwait. But the way the president defined the objectives uh, of uh, our involvement, namely to, pr to resurrect Kuwait, to protect the oil fields, and to demonstrate that we will oppose aggression, those objectives would have been accomplished. Whether or not Saddam Hussein would remain victorious in the way you have defined it would depend on what we do afterwards, what we will do vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Will we strengthen our relationship uh, to Israel to deter Saddam in that kind of arena, or, we will, or will we in, un, engage in a tense relationship with Israel, which I believe will actually strengthen Saddam? Will we move to quarantine Saddam after this compromise, if that is what occurs. If we move to quarantine him, it may make it more difficult for him to build nuclear weapons. It may make it difficult for him uh, to continue to develop his other means of destruction. Do we put pressure on our European allies, who turn out in many ways to be bad guys, or on the Brazilians, or on the Chinese uh, in this issue? How high a priority are we going to place if the, uh, on the question of arms? Certainly, the great error of the Bush administration in this crisis was made before August 2nd, 1990. That error was to take the kind of soft policy towards Saddam Hussein that the President of the United States and his administration pursued before August 2nd. Would we return to that soft policy, or would we pursue a tougher policy towards Saddam? So if there is a compromise, the jury will be out, and we do not know what will transpire. Yes, sir. Professor, your scenarios are all based on the idea that we take the initiative. Saddam Hussein has been very, very clever and has played us one against the other. 
uh, he is still very friendly with King Jordan, uh, King Hussein of Jordan. And I could see, and I would like to see what you think of that, that Saddam Hussein at some point when he's really hurting, say, we get together with King Hussein and we're going to liberate Palestine, which would mean that he can go against Syria and Israel at the same time. Now we, with American forces, are sitting in the uh, Saudi desert, but all the a other Arabs would probably have to join uh, Saddam Hussein and, and uh, Hussein of Jordan. Uh, can you see such a scenario? No, let me explain why. Uh, you envision a situation in which Saddam Hussein still holds Kuwait and the current crisis is continuing. There are almost 500,000 American troops uh, in Saudi Arabia. If Saddam Hussein were to take such an action, the American president is on record that we would react. Uh, it, it, it is not consistent with his entire strategy so far. He has taken a very passive strategy uh, militarily. He has played a very active strategy diplomatically. I, it was difficult for me to envision a situation during this crisis in which he would have any motivation to attack both uh, Syria and, uh, uh, and to engage himself in the Palestinian question. This would bring Israel into the conflict. Uh, it would certainly bring Syria in in a much stronger way. It would create great complexity. And it is not at all clear uh, that uh, the Arab states would follow him. Indeed, the Syrians have intimated that they would not follow him against Israel during this crisis. I can envision actions, uh, both subversive and otherwise, uh, in terms of subversion and otherwise, against uh, uh, Israel after the crisis. If you have some sort of compromise or some sort of settlement, then he may have an incentive to act. Don't forget that you know Ronald Reagan was an, act, an actor, George Bush was a businessman. What's the profession of Saddam Hussein? Assassin. Uh, and you know, you know, your young punk teenage assassin becomes president of his country, this is what you get. And this is what we have. He's, uh, we know that not only does uh, uh, he have a brutal regime internally, but he's gone after Iran, over a million casualties, many more than in all of the Arab-Israeli wars combined. He's gone after Kuwait, and he would likely, over a period of time, go after somebody else. That somebody else might be the Israelis, it might be the Jordanians, it might be the Syrians, it might be the Saudis. We're going to have to work to develop viable regional security, I believe as a consequence of bilateral relations with a variety of states in the area, to prevent this. And we're going to have to be very attuned to deterring Saddam Hussein. That danger, the danger to which you allude, however, would occur after the Gulf crisis and not during the Gulf crisis. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Uh, thank you. I enjoyed your talk. Uh, you. I have a comment and a question. Uh, my comment is uh, you made, you said that if you could tell Yasser Arafat what to do, you'd solve the Middle Eastern problem. But uh, saying that he could um, do something more peaceful, well, to me, I, uh, as I understand, recognizing Israel was a very, very big move on the part of the PLO that you didn't mention. Um, that's just my comment. The other, th uh, my question is that uh, do you consider the immigration of the Russian Jews to Israel is is that gonna have cause any problems in terms of Middle Eastern solving the Middle Eastern problem in the sense that uh, if they are, get settled in the occupied territories, what will happen and wh what is the United States gonna do to ensure that? I believe that the money that uh, the United States has already given Israel to settle the Russian Jewish people um, in Israel, even though they told them not to settle them in the occupied territories. They've already started settling them there, and that's going to cause a lot of problems. Well, let me take the first comment and then the question. Uh, my strategy for Yasser Arafat was a Sadat-like strategy. A Sadat-like strategy is a sustained approach. You cannot make a statement in Geneva, as he did on December 14th, uh, 1988, uh, and then uh, because of your own political problems internally, which I recognize, weave back and forth. It isn't convincing to any likely adversary, and it isn't convincing to the Israelis. Uh, and of course, in the end, 
uh, we had to break our dialogue very reluctantly uh, with Yasser Arafat because of uh, uh, his refusal to condemn the Abu Abbas supported terrorist raid, which Iraq was mixed up in, in May of 1990. Uh, and, Saddam, and Saddam Hussein, of course, gained the support of Yasser Arafat, which conveys a very different uh, signal. My strategy was a, dot, a Sadat-like strategy, a Gorbachev-like strategy, which is a strategy that, that makes sustained verbal concessions which changes the political atmosphere. And I believe that that would yield, and that is the only strategy that, that, that can yield the kind of results that Yasser Arafat claims he wants. Now, this, the, the question about Soviet Jews, I think there's a lot of misconception about this. First of all, if you do not include uh, 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 Jerusalem, which the Israelis do not recognize as uh, part, uh, uh, as outside the Green Line, uh, then it's under 0.4%, uh, uh, 0.4 of 1%. Uh, the number of Soviet Jews settling uh, in these territories. Let's get, I think it's very important to understand the nature of the Soviet Jewish immigration. These are not people like the 70s or the 80s who were by and large refuseniks. They are people who had stood up to Gorbachev and in the end hel helped, stood up to the, to the communists, I'm sorry, and in the end helped to bring the communist system down. These were people that are, were virulently anti-communist, they were uh, uh, Jewish nationalists, many of them. Uh, many of them were taken, uh, leaving a secular society. They were taken with, with the religious nature of Israel. And these were people who, if they didn't settle in the West Bank, certainly supported parties that supported uh, settlement. Now, the new Soviet Jewish immigrants are people who are escaping persecution. And when they, they did not go through the period of refusal, uh, that the others uh, of the uh, 70s and early 80s went through. They did not go through much of the suffering in earlier periods. They are looking for a new life, and they are building a new Israel. Uh, a Hebrew University uh, friend of mine was recently at our home telling me that the, uh, the floors used to be swept by Arab students. Now they're being swept by Soviet Jewish students. Soviet, this Soviet Jewish grouping is prepared to work very hard to adjust to Israel. But the flip side of that is, is they want to have a more comfortable life. They want security. They are not interested in settling in the West Bank. As Jerusalem has become an uh, area of greater controversy in the last few weeks, uh, we see a decline in the number of Soviet Jews going there. Uh, these are not people like their predecessors. And there has been a great tendency in the press and among many analysts to equate Soviet Jews uh, with the prior emigration. And therefore, I believe that they are going to move Israel in a different diplomatic direction, but you have to give that time. Let's just hope so, and let's hope the oppressed doesn't become the oppressor. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Spiegel, I have two questions. Uh, in your scenarios, uh, I was um, wondering why you did not include Israel as a wild card in taking action on its own, based on its own uh, domestic or political security needs. The other question I have uh, deals with um, President Shamir when he was here a couple days ago. His spokesperson used as a rationale uh, internal matter as a reason to oppose international investigations of Palestinians in the occupied territories. Um, isn't this also the same rationale used to fend off investigations of the persecution of Soviet Jews in Russia, as well as Jews in other inhospitable countries. In a sense, it was an internal matter. Now, the first question as to why I did not deal with Israel as a scenario, um, whenever I give this talk, everyone always tries to give me a ninth scenario. And of course, I have a personal interest in knocking them down. Uh, and this is often one of the candidates. I maintain that Israel will not be a wild card because Saddam Hussein has no interest in bringing Israel in because it would represent a major problem uh, uh, for him. Why, why gather your enemies? I mean, Saddam Hussein is too clever for that. He will leave Israel for another day, in my opinion. And there's this bunker scenario. You know, it's been a war. He's losing. He's lost. So he lobs some chemical weapons at Israel in order to show that he's really a good Arab. By then, he, the United States will make sure he doesn't have any chemical weapons. So I, I don't see that, that Israel plays a role. The Israelis are not going to uh, intervene. The one area 
where there is complete unanimity, and that's what we have seen this week um, in the Bush Amir talks, uh, is this area of the Gulf crisis, Iraq as an adversary, and the Israelis are not going to jeopardize that. If the Gulf crisis ends in some sort of compromise or defeat for the United States, and the Israelis see themselves alone confronting a growing power of Iraq, then I think it's a very different story. And uh, a preemptive strike by Israel uh, becomes uh, possible, perhaps likely, perhaps justified. I think there will be a great deal of sympathy in the Western world for such an action, even as now there is great sympathy for the act of the Israelis uh, in, 19, in June of 1981 in knocking out the uh, OSIRAC, the nuclear reactor, uh, in Baghdad. Now, as far as the second issue is concerned, number one, I believe that the Israeli government, uh, first of all, made obvious errors in the handling, in the police handling of the Temple Mount incident. Secondly, that it, wa that it should have accepted uh, uh, a UN, UN visit uh, at the time. Uh, that was controversial in Israel. It was a decision uh, the Israeli government made to make a statement to the international community, don't touch us, but I think it was a mistake. Serious people can disagree. I think they were in error. But I do not disagree with them on their posture about investigation. You cannot compare. You cannot make the analogy. Analogies are one of the most difficult questions in foreign affairs. As, sec as former Secretary of State Haig, remember him? Uh, uh, as he wrote uh, in the New York Times this week, I mean, is this another Vietnam or, I or is it another Munich? Uh, analogies are a problem. The issue of human rights in the Soviet Union was of a closed society. In Israel, uh, whenever there is a problem, you have the Israeli press, let alone the international press, getting all sorts of information. The Temple Mount incident, one of the reasons that Israel had the many problems it did was that there was a videotape released of a good part of that incident. And it, it did not see everything that was happening, but the camera sees only one view. And that was the view that was uh, uh, accepted. When you have an open society, I believe that you have a system of at least minimum checks and balances. And therefore, the UN investigation becomes a political statement which should be settled in negotiations. We have to deal with the Palestinian issue. This should be settled in a negotiating process. It shouldn't be settled by other parties. And that's why I would oppose uh, a kind of ombudsman type of approach. Yes, sir. Right. Professor, of your uh, scenarios, I still believe that we'll see number one and number seven combined. That is the fast victory uh, based on heavy air power. Um, but uh, one reason I believe that is I just heard on the radio coming here tonight that the United States has turned down the Iraq uh, request that Secretary Baker go there on the 12th of January. And our reason is because that's too close to the 15th of January. That could par possibly just be another part of the bluff and the threat and so forth. But it sounds like uh, the administration is uh, certainly geared up for military action. But suppose your scenario five does happen and there is a compromise and we do pull back. Uh, I, I've got a similar question, uh, I guess, and you've already answered it, that the Israelis would then uh, see themselves threatened and they'll go in and take out the chemical and the atomic. But I guess I have a broader question then. How do we, as Americans, influence Israeli policy? How do we influence the Israelis not to take action or to take action or to come to the bargaining table? Uh, it seems like uh, the Israelis, and I'm not an expert in this field, are more intransigent on the Palestinian situation. What is stopping them from giving the Palestinians their own homeland, redrawing the boundaries? If that'll solve the, uh, the problem for everybody, how can we influence the Israelis to uh, do what we feel is right? Uh, first of all, uh, let me indicate that my uh, scenario one involved ground troops. My scenario seven did not. I, I don't think either is going to happen. And I'm unimpressed by uh, this negotiation about dates because, after all, first Saddam Hussein was, was not going to release the hostages until there was a settlement, and then he was going to release them by March 15th, and then he was going to bring them home for Christmas. And I think we'll see a trip by uh, James Baker to Baghdad uh, 
before January 15th. Uh, and I, I, I think that that will come off, and I'm not impressed by, by the fact that maybe there's a dis disagreement about the dates. Saddam Hussein plays his games, and then he makes his decisions. The, uh, uh, the question is a much longer term uh, uh, issue. Uh, the question involves Israeli security, Palestinian rights, uh, and how you, uh, and if you can at all, make some sort of balance between them. Uh, the growing tragedy of Palestinian-Israeli conflict, uh, the stabbings inside Israel, the growing violence, the attacks on Palestinian collaborators, uh, and always throughout Palestinian history in this century, the attacks on so-called collaborators or moderates who were supposedly cooperating with Israel have hurt the peace process. This is a very complex balance. Now, what we have to do is to gain Israel's confidence if we want to move this process forward as far as our influence on the Israelis are concerned. And we also have to, of course, gain the Arab confidence as well. We've gone very far in gaining Arab confidence, it seems to me, by our willingness to stand up for Arab regimes in this crisis. And a clever administration will use that goodwill that has been achieved after the Persian Gulf crisis in moving forward with the Arab states, which is why I have tried to move the dialogue to discussion of the involvement of Arab states with Israel, not just the Palestinians. Now, there is inside Israel a very odd coalition that is growing between the far left and the far right about the separation of the two communities. One side, the far right, wants to give up the people, what the, uh, the Palestinian people. It wants to separate the people and wants more territory. The far left wants to give up the land. But there is an argument, it is not a majority argument yet, but it is an argument growing in Israel that there has to be a kind of cooling off period between these two communities. We ought to be exploring possibilities there. If you look at Israeli public opinion polls, there are 30 or percent or, sh or so who are in favor of major concessions because they believe that is the best way to assure Israeli security. There are 30 percent or so who uh, oppose ever giving up or giving up under most conditions uh, uh, the territory because they believe either in Israel having that territory for religious or nationalist reasons or more of them because of security reasons. And Saddam Hussein, his strength in Jordan, his strength on the West Bank, have strengthened these individuals in the last few weeks. The Gulf crisis has made this problem harder to solve, make no mistake about it, because of the support for Saddam Hussein among the Palestinians. But the, the silent majority, as President Nixon used to call them, the 40 percent in the middle of the Israeli electorate, and I believe that these will grow with Soviet immigrants, will be affected by what, uh, the nature of the American relationship the attitude of Arabs. We are in the center. We can make a difference. And we have to do it by carrots rather than by sticks, by showing our sympathy for the Israelis. Whenever American presidents historically have used carrots, they've been far more effective than with sticks. And I think that President Bush has gone a bit too far in creating a tension in that relationship this year. One of the failures of the Bush presidency so far has been the mismanagement of the relationship with Israel and the tension that we saw. Perhaps in their meeting yesterday morning, which went over, uh, President Bush and Prime Minister Shamir have begun to stand back from that tension and begin, begin to build a relationship which is necessary if you're going to have progress on the Arab-Israeli front. By our applause, we've already thanked you, but let me thank you again for what I think is a very edifying evening. Thanks very much.